It was two o'clock in the morning. The city of Liverpool was being drenched by a biblical downpour as a gaggle of homeward bound clubbers gathered round a bus shelter outside the Mardi Gras nightclub on Mount Pleasant. Taxis were whistled for but they failed to stop. But suddenly a bus approached at Daffan Leslie from the direction of the Shell station coming from Lime Street. A 2am bus service was unheard of in 1966, but a young man, high on purple hearts, jokingly put his hand out, and to his great surprise, the bus, bearing the number 12C, halted at the stop. This double-decker was painted black, its headlamps were of a faint gleaming amber, and the interior was in darkness, suggesting a drain battery, or the activation of some power-saving mode on behalf of the driver. But that driver smiled and beckoned the seven or eight people to climb on board his vehicle. How altruistic! But such kindness is typical of Liverpool people. The upper deck was already full, so the newly embarked passengers sat and stood downstairs, and they chatted to one another, while some lit up woodbines. Where's the inspector? asked the bemused twenty-year-old man named Ray. His inner ears were still ringing from the music of the Mardi. Weighing up the situation, his finger stroked his Van Dyke beard, as a blonde, twiggy look-alike, seated opposite, fitted with a loose false eyelash between her glances over at him. Stu, the nineteen-year-old on purple arts, was leaning on the pole at the back of the bus, callously waving at the drenched folk being left behind on Mount Pleasant. All of a sudden there was a flash of lightning and hail began to pelt the bus. The number 12 accelerated at an incredible speed and the inertia sent all those who had been standing down on the floor in a heap. Screams filled the vehicle. Ray saw the Georgian doorways of Oxford Street flitting past the windows and fear made him swear. Slow down, will ya? He shouted towards the driver but the engine continued its high-pitched whine and the bus careered on an even faster trajectory through the driving rain. The Twiggy twin was quickly reduced to tears and she cut the arms of another young woman seated next to her. Abercrombie Square whizzed by in a heart-stopping flash and Stu was hanging from the pole at the back of the bus, sick with fear. Ray estimated the bus's speed as being somewhere in excess of over 80 miles per hour at least, and still it was accelerating, throwing up tidal waves of rainwater as its tyres passed through puddle lakes. What was that weird noise barely audible over the roaring engine? The passengers upstairs were all laughing hysterically. I'm getting off. I only live in the bully shouted him round with glasses on, trying to convince himself that this was a normal bus. The vehicle tore up the hill of Grimfield Street, and yet its engine didn't even labour one rev. And as the bus turned down Overton Street, it leaned sickeningly about 40 degrees to the right. Everyone on board thought his number was up. Everything tilted, but miraculously the bus righted itself on the wrong side of the road and screeched into a care which almost took it through the windows of Kay Nelson on Wavertree Road. People prayed, cried and swore as the bus mounted the curb of the Picton Clock traffic island and flew on down to Chilwall. By now they calculated that it was travelling at around 120 miles per hour and the petite blonde threw up all over Ray as he edged to the back of the bus wondering if he dared to leap off the platform where Stu was clinging on for dear life with his arms and legs wrapped around the bar and his eyes clenched shut. Ray wondered why the maniac driving the bus was going so fast and how was he managing to go so fast? Surely it was impossible for a double-decker to reach such fantastic speeds. He suddenly felt a strange impulse to look up and there on the shadowy stairs stood a pale-faced individual whom he immediately recognised. An individual who'd been dead for over a decade. Mr Ryan, the dirty old man who had lived next door to Ray when he was a child. Ray found himself taking his nan's rosary beads from his inside pocket, 
feeding them through his fingers as he recited the Lord's Prayer out loud. The middle-aged man who wanted to get off at the bowling quickly joined in. It was obvious to Ray that this black bus, which could travel at speeds no corporation bus could ever attain, had to have something to do with the supernatural. The devil himself, perhaps. Ray suddenly had the sickening conviction that the passengers on the top deck were all dead people, and bad dead people at that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, Ray shouted, now directing the prayer at the silhouetted driver, and sure enough the bus started to slow down, finally coming to a halt on Chilwall Valley Road. The passengers scrambled to disembark as quickly as they could, some shaking with fear, and others with fury at having been subjected to such an ordeal. Stu tried to prise open the door of the bus driver's cab, intending to give him a good pasting, but the vehicle's demonic engine began to throb as it stared back into life, and as a ghostly mist invaded the valley of Chilwall, the black bus moved off, and in full view of the traumatised passengers from Mount Pleasant, the vehicle faded away into nothingness as it passed under the railway bridge that spanned the road 